Welcome back to the Winter Growers Podcast. Today's guest is Elizabeth Keene of Indian Line Farm in Western Massachusetts. Farming for 27 years, Elizabeth began her farm with her husband on land that was the birthplace of the CSA model popularized by Robin Van N. in 1986. Stewarding this important property, Elizabeth started her CSA with 12 member shares in 1997, which has since grown to 250 members, plus sales at a farmer's market and some restaurants and stores, all from five acres of production. The farm is certified naturally grown, and Elizabeth is an active member of CRAFT, the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training Program, which trains future farmers. The farm has three high tunnels, uses no heat in winter, and focuses on producing chard, kale, spinach, lettuce, scallions, radicchio, and cilantro as fresh winter crops. The farm is financially stable and viable, and Elizabeth has been the full-time grower since 2003, deriving all her income from the farm. Not only is Elizabeth a seasoned farmer with a successful CSA model and story, she is also a farmer who prioritizes community, family, self-care, and a healthy work-life balance as an inspiring example for others to follow. This episode of the Winter Growers Podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are designed and built in Italy where small-scale farming has been a way of life for generations. Discover the beauty of BCS on your farm with PTO-driven implements for soil working, shredding cover crops, spreading compost, mowing under fences, clearing snow, and more, all powered by a single gear-driven machine that's tailored to the size and scale of your operation. Tractors and attachments are on sale now. Find sale pricing and your nearest dealer at bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. So our work has always been about keeping farming information as free and open to the public as we possibly can. And that won't change. One way in which we make that possible, though, is through advertising on podcasts like this, on our YouTube channel, on our forum and so on. So if you are a small farm-related company selling seeds or tools or something growers could use, or if you're an organization putting on some conference or offering a grant or looking for farmer contributors or something, or something else farm-related that I'm not thinking of, uh, get in touch with us at farmermichelle at notillgrowers.com. That's farmermichelle at notillgrowers.com. Uh, supporting us helps to grow this work and grow farmers. So we all thank you. Again, that email is farmermichelle at notillgrowers.com or you can find our contact information at notillgrowers.com. All right, thanks y'all. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Winter Growers Podcast. Today, I have Elizabeth Keene of Indian Line Farm in Massachusetts. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, I uh, actually, you were recommended by a listener. So um, I was really excited to start researching about your farm. And everything that I've learned so far is incredibly fascinating. Um, I learned that your farm is the birthplace of the original CSA. Uh, which is fabulous. And I'm really excited to hear more about that. Uh, also, you've been farming for 27 years. Uh, so you are definitely a veteran. And um, the, you know, winter growing aspect of that, too. I'm curious about how that has evolved over the years. And uh, yeah, just to, to get to know you and your farming story. So thank you for being here. Yeah, great. Thank you. Excited to talk farming. Good. Well, I'd love to get started with um, your background. How did you get into this and how have you stayed in it for so long? Yeah. Um, so I, my, my interests originally in life were um, Latin America and Latin American history and politics. And I, I pretty much knew from a very young age that I would live and work in Latin America. And so after college, I um, worked for Amnesty International for a year and then through there, made some connections in Washington, D.C. and went and worked in Guatemala and southern Mexico with an organization called Witness for Peace. And we led delegations to the area and we, you know, educated folks on the political situation with the idea of them coming back to the United States and being activists and, 
and trying to create U.S. policies towards Latin America that were essentially just. And um, it was there that I had my first real perspective on what it meant to work land and people's connections to land. So the population of refugees that I worked with would, they were all the subsistence farmers. And I, um, you know, I had this three and a half year period where essentially, you know, I worked outside a lot. I visited a lot of refugee camps and I, I, I had this connection with land and people who are connected to land in a way that I had never experienced. So when I, it was time for me to come back, I, um, there was just this idea of being able to, like, I wanted to learn what it felt like to be on a farm. So, yeah. So after those three years, I came back to the States. I went on this thousand mile bike tour with some friends around New England and ended up in Great Barrington. That's a much longer story, which you don't really want to know. But it was, um, it was there that I met up with a delegate who I had worked with. And she introduced me to David Ingalls, who was the farmer at Mahewi Harvest CSA. What, what year was this, just to give a point of time? Yeah, so this was in, uh, this was 1996. Okay. And it was that year I met David Ingalls and I met this farm and I discovered what CSA was. I'd never heard of that. And my first season, you know, my first, one of the first things we did was I have to clear out a sheep barn of, um, of manure and all by hand. And I fell in love. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you could be this happy doing physical work. And from there, um, met Robin Van Ann. I met a lot of people in this community. This is a very um, farm-friendly community. It's, it's uh, you know, a lot of small farms. And it was here that I, I met Robin Van Ann, who a lot of people know as being one of the pioneers of community-supported agriculture. And she was in need of someone to help her organize the first CSA conference in the Northeast. And so she hired me that right after my apprenticeship to help her. And within three months, she had passed away. And so that was a very pivotal moment for me and for my to-be husband at that point. The loss of Robin um, meant... well, it meant a lot of things for a lot of people in our community, but for me, it was a a window opening both to this property, but also to this this world of community supported agriculture. So, in a very short period of time, um, I was sort of tapped on the shoulder to actually have that conference. Uh, come to fruition. And I met a lot of amazing people in the Northeast, a lot of growers, a lot of nonprofits. And, um, and from there, uh, her family and a couple local nonprofits wanted to see that Al and I had a chance to be at this farm. And it all happened super quickly. It, it wasn't something I was actually looking for at that point, even though it's, I thought, agriculture might be in my in my future i actually wanted to go back to guatemala to teach horticulture and um make a long story short we um we ended up partnering with the nature conservancy and the community land trust and the southern berkshires and created um well we were an example of this model of those three folks three entities coming together so we had a 99 year lease to be here and we have a conservation restriction on the property, which takes a lot of our rights away, but then allows us to grow organically and, um, you know, do pretty much what we want to do. And then, um, you know, we have certain obligations to maintain a certain amount of food for human consumption. Um, and the idea is that when we choose to pass this farm along, it's transferable, it's um, saleable. We own all the buildings, so we would sell, hopefully, um, our interest in the the actual structures. And ideally, we would be actually selling our farm business. That's what every farmer hopes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there was a lot there. I'm, I'm curious what 
what did you, what was the, la- so it was called Indian uh, Line Farm when you arrived. That was the name, the existing name. First of all, where did that name come from? Very good question. So when the, this, our farm used to be a dairy farm and it was a very small one. It's uh, the, there I think were 35 stanchions in this large barn that we have. And um, when they came here in the early 1900s, they, many of the deeds that are along our street uh, refer to the Indian line. And there's a northerly and a southerly line. And depending on how you talk about indigenous history and the taking over of land, um, th- there was a, a mile wide, wide strip of land that was sort of reserved for the indigenous communities here for free passage after they essentially sold sold <laughs> in parentheses um, or in quotations their their property to the original. Or to the uh, the later residents of Egremont. So these uh, these this line passes from like the Housatonic River in Mass to another river in New York. Um, so that's where they got the name. They they liked the fact that uh, that it referenced this piece of history, and so they named it. And the northerly part of our farm is on the Indian line, and it. Is it flat land? Was it, you know, fertile and flat land too? Yeah, the, the farm part, yes. It's, um, it's, a, it's, there's a lot of wetland around us. Um, there's a creek to, the, to our south. Um, but we're in the Berkshire Hills, so there's a lot of up and down. And um, it, yeah, I mean, this, this area actually, so the area in which this Indian line is, it actually takes you up and over multiple hills and small mountains and so it's not like all like it's not like uh you know it's not like it passes by a river or follows is adjacent to it's not and when you and your husband first arrived uh what was the state of the land the farm you know what were the sort of early beginnings yeah so um the initial csa was here for three years from 1986 to 1990 90 about 89 and then there were actually a number of issues with robin as the landowner and the wonderful people who she was working with and as sometimes all well-intentioned people, their conflicts can arise. So after those first three years, the CSA actually moved to the farm that I later apprenticed. And though Robin and a, you know, a core group of people tried to keep the CSA going for a couple of years, by 1993, I believe, there was no, um, there was, there was no more CSA here. So in those interim years, I think she leased out her land for um, hay and then immediately before we were here, it was uh, part of a squash cooperative. So just winter squash was being grown here. So when we got here, there was no business. Okay, so you really began from scratch. And I think I read somewhere that you started with just 12 shares. Yeah. And all of those were two employees of the Orion Magazine. That's right. In Great mm-hmm. Barrington. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, you now have what, 250 shares? Mm -hmm. So yeah, what was it like in the early days? And how did you know that, you know, or how did you trust that this model would work? Yeah, we, um, I mean, I have to say, even before those 12 shares, we just did a few farmers markets because we felt like we had so little experience. Um, I didn't want to cause myself a heart attack by committing to CSA members that I wasn't actually sure that I could, I could give produce to. So we did, um, yeah, we did markets for probably two years. And then started with that 12 members. Um, yeah. How did we, how did we know we wanted to go there? I think partly because I didn't have a lot of, I didn't have any conventional farming experience. I didn't have any other farming experience. And because there wasn't really another great option for CSA right around us, we thought, well, there's, we think there's a hole here and let's see if we can fill it. And we both, you know, we're young, we had tons of energy and we both managed to just make a lot of really great connections in our community, I feel like in a short period of time. And so that's kind of where we were always headed. I think as we became better growers, like I didn't, I think I used to think that we had enough land just to grow a hundred shares. 
and as I became a better grower and understand our property and the land and, you know, nutrition and all of that, you know, I feel like there's the potential, there's still there, there's still gr- potential for growth. And at what point did you start playing around with winter growing or, you know, offering things year round? It, was that early on or did that come much later? Yeah, that definitely came later. We didn't, um, we didn't, um, yeah, we didn't really know what that market would be. And again, we sort of, we did not have a farming, <laughs> we didn't have a farming base to start with. So everything that we did every single year felt like, felt like it was new. So I would say it wasn't until after maybe our 10th year that, or maybe it was year seven where we actually put up a, a large greenhouse and then we had chickens for a while. So they, they stayed in the greenhouse um, and we just use it for winter, you know, for summer growing. Um, and then we realized chickens was n- not where we needed to be c- concentrating any of our energy. And so then we had these structures that were, um, that were vacant in the winter. And yeah, so I would say it was about 12 years ago. And the real um, inspiration was a local organization local organization called Berkshire Grown started a, um, a fall, like a November and a December market. And from there it went year round. And so they have a market once a month and we are able to move almost the equivalent amount of products during those once a month markets that I would in like July or August, like very high volume, a lot of really great support. You know, people come out there, they are craving local food. So we, uh, you know, we started out with one house and, you know, now we have three and they're, you know, they're planted year round. They're fully planted right now. And we have a market this weekend. And do you sell, are you doing both a winter CSA in addition to the market or is it all just for the market? Yeah, it is all just for the market. I think that's the the CSA part. I've had so many people request that we do it. Um, I think this is part of that farmer taking care of yourself thing. I I can move all this product in six days, you know, over the course of six months, um, and then and very little communication. You know, I just send out one email to a thousand people, and you know they they end up at the market. Or occasionally, I'll do a few a pop up market if I feel like we have a lot. But um, our our farm, I might have been, is a little bit on a hill, and it, I'm actually a little terrified of having to keep the driveway so well maintained in the winter months that I haven't really wanted people to come here, especially in January and February. And, you know, I might change my mind in the future, but it's um, right now, this really works for us. I like the, the intermittent nature of the once a month. And again, we're able to just move so much on one single day that it, it works. Yeah, no, it sounds very smart, efficient, and, um, uh, kind to you as the farmer. So, um, yes, <laughs> um, I, you know, and also the, you know, the, the CSA members would be able to get it at that market anyway. So, you know, it's just a slightly different way to get your food. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. and what, what are the primary crops that you, or what's your favorite crop to grow? What's the easiest crop to grow? What's your focus in the winter? Yeah, we um we grow a lot of chard. I just am amazed how well chard will do in the middle of the winter. I mean, we have plants that are, you know, they're like three, three, two, two and a half feet tall. And uh yeah, I just feel like I can't kill the chard. <laughs> I love to bunch it. I love rainbow chard. I just think it's a really fun, fun crop. Um the other is of course fresh spinach. You know, we, we seem like we've got that dialed in a little bit. And then I love to grow cilantro. I just am amazed at how well cilantro does in the hoop house. Yeah, no, that that is um, that is one of the un, unsung heroes, I would say, of the the winter greenhouse for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I always find it fascinating that it's the crop that people most uh, notably associate with warmer climates, and yet it grows so well in our cool climate. Yeah, the the flavor of it changes in the winter too. It's a little more subdued. Um, yeah. So people that yeah. don't necessarily like cilantro might actually enjoy it more in the winter. <laughs> um, and what about, do you have storage crops that you're combining with the, the sales as well? Uh, or Yeah, we grow, yeah, we grow a ton of carrots, beets, uh, the multiple different kinds of daikon. Um, is that it? A lot of onions, shallots, garlic. 
Yeah. Well, a couple things we don't grow. We don't grow potatoes, sweet potatoes, or winter squash. Um, given the nature of our land and all of that, I um, as I just buy them for our CSA members from a local certified organic farm. So, and I'm only allowed to sell at these markets what I grow myself. So I don't have those products. And how have you learned over the years to, you know, sort of organize the dance of summer production into the winter production, especially within the high tunnels, since that space is, you know, generally occupied with summer crops? Yeah, um, I have I have realized that one, it's okay to take stuff out early. <laughs> I mean, we always like, you know, hang on to some of those tomato plants, you know, that have been producing since early June. And that it really is okay to let go of some of those, you know, a little bit earlier than maybe it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay to, it's okay to let go of a few things. Um, I think we also, it's okay. And I've decided it's okay to leave a few beds bare so that when August comes around or, you know, September 1st or August 15th, that the space is ready. Cause that's of course when we're all nuts and busy and, you know, if there's a few beds that we just, uh, you know, covered with a tarp, um, you know, in, in early June or whatever, uh, they're ready to go. That's smart. Yeah. Um, it, it's always such a hard, you know, balance, though, because you want to maximize your production, you know, in the space when you have it, right? And then it's heartbreaking to take things out too soon. But yeah, but you got to make you have to have some compromises for sure. So um, do you do you have a barn space large enough to rip all the tomatoes out and hang them upside down so you can <laughs> get them going for a little longer? You know what? I've never done that. We do, we do have a large barn, um, but that's I know I've never done they that. They don't taste as good, Maybe but you know, you get yeah. that tomato <laughs> later in the in the early winter. Yeah, I mean I will say that I always leave a few tomatoes uh, and actually so this is part of my sequence. I always leave two beds of tomatoes in till the bitter end and then those two beds are the beds that I plant carrots in in December. So we managed to have some tomatoes through the very very end and then I put my carrots in. Yeah, and I've always noticed by that point, I mean they're not doing anything because the light is so low at that point that they're just sitting there. So um, that's great. So then that means you get carrots. Is the, is this a heated greenhouse or no? So these are yeah. This is uh -huh. all unheated space. Um, so the carrots are usually ready the second week of May. Yeah, I was just going to say. So by yeah. May, and we yeah. grow we grow bolero, you know, and we don't plant them. We plant them right at the solstice, December solstice, uh -huh. and then um, yeah by. You know, we usually have carrots for a good three weeks. That's such a great treat. I love that. <laughs> yeah, love it. Love it. Yeah, people people go nuts for them. Hey, podcast listeners, we're going to pause for a moment to hear from one of our show sponsors. Today's episode of the Winter Growers Podcast is brought to you by Johnny's Selected Seeds. When you need proven varieties you can count on and detailed guidance from seeding to harvest, consider Johnny's your trusted growing partner. Our same-day shipping can help keep your planting schedules on track when the unexpected happens. We're here to help you grow good food. Turning to Johnny's means you can plant high-quality, trial-proven varieties with confidence and know that our expert staff is ready to help with first-hand knowledge because we've grown them ourselves. This episode is also brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or vegetables for your family, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment for a harvest you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are strong, durable, and easy to assemble, offering the quality you need to grow productively year-round. The team of experts at Rimmel will be your trusted partners to ensure you get exceptional value from your greenhouse investment. Visit Rimmel.com today. All right, back to the show. One of the things I read in, in an article written about you is you were quoted saying, once you put energy into land, you become connected. And I would love to hear, you know, you describe more what you meant by that and what you mean by that. Yeah, wow, that was a long time ago. I remember saying that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think very, very early on when, when Al and I were here, we, you know, starting to host a whole plant, starting to plant the seeds and take care of the plants. Um, I think partly because I'd never had that feeling before. I'd never felt what it like, what it's like to really engage in 
a place. And so that amount of, even just that small amount of energy, the energy, the first couple of years, you kind of, I kind of felt like you're like pouring your soul into this. And the idea of having to pick up and leave and do that somewhere else felt so almost like violent to your, to your being. And so I feel for so many farmers who, you know, don't necessarily have long-term tenure on their farms and do have to do that. And I think, yeah, having that, uh, that feeling and, and knowing that we'd already put that energy in made us want to stay here that much more. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, There was also another really interesting quote you said. uh, You said, I've worked 80 hour weeks and I've worked hard and I felt it physically and mentally and emotionally. And for me to be a mom and a farm manager and the owner, something has had to give. I'm curious what often did give and how have you learned to balance that over the years? Yeah, I um one of the f- the first things when my daughter, my second child was born, we we made I I mainly made the decision that I didn't want to have apprentices here anymore. Um for a a break. I needed to know that I could hire some employees and that they arrived at 7 or 8 and that they left at 5 and I didn't have to think about training them or being something to them other than just their a good employer during those eight hours. And that was, that was the thing. Number one. Um, I also had to start taking off like Monday through Wednesday in the afternoons. So I had crew here, but I was essentially, you know, inside doing other, I was being a mom. Um, and at times that was really hard, but it just began to be the routine. And it also meant that we as a threesome would eventually end up outside, but it was, um, it was being able to be really clear with my crew, you know, when they, when I hired them that this is what my schedule was going to be. Um, and then I think when we started having these just incredible, like these really regular hours and I'm, I'm all for having regular farm hours and I really respect my employees time. And, and so it made me really efficient. It made me super clear about the most important things that needed to be needed to be done on any given day. And in the end, it actually made us get more done in less time. And so I too could ha- try to have those same hours. Um, and I have to say that I certainly, worked many, many nights and evenings on some of those other tasks that don't necessarily involve being outside and was exhausted a lot of the time. Um, I feel like in those early years, we, we managed a balance that worked. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm also curious about, um, your partner, you, uh, was he working on the farm with you to a certain degree, but also had an off-farm job? And how did you manage that? Yeah. So um, when we, when it became really possible that we were going to able to buy into this new model, we had to go get a mortgage. And we both had come from sort of volunteering experiences for the prior years. So one of us had to get a job because there was no way, we had no record of our farm making any money whatsoever. So he um, he had gone to engineering school and ended up um, working with the local land surveyor, which he was very excited about. That wasn't even something he knew that he could do with his degree. So the idea was that he um, he always worked Thursdays and Fridays on the farm. And so that was his early contribution in addition to any other time of the evening or weekend where he was needed, (laughs) which was a lot early on. Um, And that pretty much stayed until 2016, 15. Maybe he had gone to four one day a week by then, but um, he pretty much has had a a one day a week um, for the last 10 years. Um, in addition to whatever weekends are needed. And his role is 
critical and he doesn't get a lot of, I think, credit for being the person that maintains all the equipment. And, you know, if something breaks, it's so rare that he can't fix it. And so, and he, he and I both realized early on that he was not the person who should be the manager. That is not a skill that he has. He has a lot of other ones, but that one's not it. So we became very good at what our division of labor was early on. And, uh, and, and now it, it works. He's, he's an integral part, but, but I'm the one who really, I do all the planning, all, all the work with all the coworkers and pretty much any, any organizing, organizing with the farm. That's, that's on me. And you have uh, two kids as well. So obviously, um, they've grown up on the farm. How old are they now? And what was their influence? Or what, you know, what, what are they taking with them as they grow older? Yeah, yeah. So um, I have a son who's 20. And he is, you know, currently working. And he not on the farm, he, he works somewhere else. Um, and Helen is uh, 17. So she has two more years of or a year and a half more of high school. And they, um, you know, they've always been a part of what we've done. Like, just there's so many memories of them being on in the field with us and in the barn with us. And so many of my coworkers and employees over the years just have fond memories of them being around. Um, once they got a little bit older, we started instigating a, um, a two hour a day work requirement during non like summer breaks and yeah, summer breaks. And, um, you know, I'm sure people do it all different ways. I think that they didn't, they, they didn't love that all the time. (laughs) I'm (laughs) I'm not surprised. (laughs) Yeah. Um, each of them had, you know, they're very different children and, uh, each of them kind of gravitated towards different things. But, um, once they have, they were able to have their own part-time jobs doing other things, that's where they went. And that that's fine. It's totally fine. They're both very hard workers and we get really great feedback from people who know them in their other, their other work lives. So that's, that's good. Um, you know, for me, having them just made my farm, made me want the farm to be really welcoming to families in general. So, you know, especially when my kids were young, we had a ton of families with young kids and it was, you know, a really great experience for, you know, whenever they would come, the ki- my kids were, you know, ecstatic that a lot of other people were here that they could play with. And, you know, it made me really think about, you know, what is it like for a mom to go down or a father or, you know, just someone to go down with a young person? Um, and what is that experience like? So thinking ahead about making it uh, fun, but also accessible and, and easy, I guess, as easy as it can be. Yeah, well, I, um, <clears throat> I can feel for for your kids uh, in in the required farming part. I, I always say that, you know, what, one of the best gifts that my dad gave me is that he didn't force me, <laughs> so to speak, to farm um, and allowed me to find my own curiosity with it. Um, and so that was something that I passed on to my sons as well, because uh, I just feel that this work is already hard enough as it is. It, it better be something that you are willing and desire to do. Otherwise, it's going to feel like drudgery, right? And who knows? Something might something might change in the next five to ten years, and maybe they'll be back. But it's uh, it will be because they they want to be exactly, and that's the most important thing for sure. Um, yeah, and and so you have been involved. Uh, I was reading an active member for over twenty years of Craft, which is the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training Program. And I'm curious what that looks like. If you can describe that a little bit more, how it works on your farm. Yeah, sure. So um, we and actually just to let you know, Al and I both were members of Craft as participants. So the farm that I was working at as an apprentice was a participant in craft. And so the idea is, uh, you know, it's changed a little bit over the years, but now it's about every two weeks, uh, all the apprentices meet up on an individual farm and there's a tour from two to five on a Monday afternoon. And the, you know, as part of the steering committee, we, um, or the 
it's not a steering committee. All the farmers are part of the committee. Um, you know, we choose a schedule that is well representing of all of the kinds of farming that can be done. So, um, you know, there's a lot of livestock, there's, you know, a lot of vegetable farms, some are CSA, some are market, some are wholesale. And for me as a participant, it really opened my eyes to the incredible breadth of possibilities. And it also, when Al and I started farming very, very young, we all, we had many of those farmers reach out to us and say, we would love and be happy to be resources for you. So if you need anything and, and over the years, those, even those folks have may be, have become colleagues and friends and, and, and true resources for information. Um, and that, you know, continues now we have, um, an issue a little bit where there are less farms in our area that are wanting to have apprentices. And there's, that's a multifaceted conversation about why that's happening. Um, I think that there's some, at some point, a lot of these kids are coming out of college with really, really high debt. And so some of them can't really afford to like really be apprentices. So a lot of us, um, started paying, uh, you know, just a, not a stipend, but actual regular wages. And I think that's helped a, f- a lot for far- if farmers have chosen to do it that way. But um, it still continues to be a really great way for young people to uh, really see what's possible in the world of farming. And I know there's a number of craft groups still around the country. The Midwest has one and um, there's one in the Hudson Valley. And so how many... Uh- How many employees do you have annually and, you know, how many have gone through your farm cumulatively? I'm assuming you've trained a lot of young farmers. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Good (laughs) question. Um, There have been, you know, at least 50 to 60 people who've worked with me over the years. Currently, I always like to say that I need about four people here every day to make this farm work. And, and that doesn't include me, so that would be five. Um, but over the last couple of years, we've been taking on more part-time people. So last year, we had anywhere from nine, well, including my daughter, who sometimes works. It's about eight people. Eight part-time people were around last summer. Some people worked for two days, some five, some three. And most of those folks were returning people. So I was willing to be... Um, you know, willing to accommodate because they're awesome people. But uh, yeah, that's been a little bit of an issue. We we live in a very, very, um, it's a word, like housing is just so incredibly expensive here. So trying to accommodate people's other possibilities of maybe earning a wage that's a little bit higher than I can pay, even though I've tried to up that a lot over the last couple of years. Um, so do you have uh, employees living on the farm then? Is that the model or are they commuting? Yeah. At this point, everyone's commuting. Yeah. For for the right person, we have a, we have a dwelling that, that someone can stay in. But for the most part, um, we're, we want people to find their own housing. And for the most part, I'm finding people who already live here as it, as it stands over the last five, six, seven years. Um, I'm finding folks who already live here or are moving back to live with relatives or something like that. And do you have, what sort of structure do you follow? Um, do you have, a, a, you know, sort of a farm manager underneath you uh, or some sort of team leader? How, how do you organize your employees? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I am still the team leader and the manager. Um, I have been actually looking to have someone take that role. Um, and it's either that I'm too much of a micromanager, which I'm sort of self-examining <laughs> that, or the farm is just not quite large enough. Um, so we're, there's that. I have certain roles that people have. Like I've uh, generally every year I have someone who's in charge of the greenhouses and the we talk about, you know, what needs to happen. They're, they're in charge of sort of, you know, pruning and managing and prepping beds and things like that. And are you finding that you're getting return employees, even though, you know, they live off farm, but they are coming back year to year? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would say, um, 
Yeah, every year. I mean, this year, yeah, we have three returning folks. Um, I've had a number of times where people leave and then they come back. Um, the longest someone that was ever here was eight years, which was amazing. Yeah, I mean, that it is that's just... A, that's a gift. I know. That's a gift. And it's such a continuous challenge with, you know, small farms is how do you, how do you build, you know, an organization that has long-term employees? You know, it, it is really a challenging nut to crack, I would say. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I actually feel like that's probably the biggest hurdle to me as I get a little bit older is what is the equation that's going to work? That's going to keep someone really happy and stay here. Um, you know, cause I get generally really great feedback uh, of my ability to be a good employer. So it's, um, I mean, I think one of it, one of them is year round employment. That's pretty much the key. That, to that's that. why we're talking about <laughs> winter growing and year round growing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I'm also curious in some of the pre, you know, interview questions I asked you about um, if you're able to take time off, uh, you know, as a winter year round grower and you answered yes. And you have very good farm boundaries. So I'd love to hear what you do to, to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, one, I, I love to, I'm, I'm a very physical person and I get a little antsy if I'm not moving around. So, um, I walk my dogs every day, go on a really nice hike, either around the farm or, or elsewhere. And I sometimes try to coordinate that with another human being so that it keeps me connected to other folks who aren't necessarily farmers, other friends. Um, I love going to CrossFit. To me, the physical body is just uh, mine. Just it's the only thing I have, right? And um, I feel that I learned so much about lifting and posture and and strength from going to that. And I love the camaraderie and I love the challenge. So that's really important to me. Um, and I love listening to audiobooks and that sort of escape is to me just really, really great. And I love it that I can listen to them and be anywhere and be almost doing anything. So that feels like something that wasn't possible 20 years ago. I, you know, I had to be inside or in my car listening to a CD. So I love that. Um, and we, um, we're pretty diehard every winter. We go away for at least a week, sometimes two. Now, as my kids have been older, we can't take them out of school as much. But um, our go-to place is Culebra, Puerto Rico. And we've been there since... We've been there for like 17 years or something. It's really, really a special place and it's super mellow. Um, and then we always try to take off uh, sometime in the fall, at least for a long weekend or a little bit longer. Again, with the kids and school, that's been a little bit harder. Um, and then one thing that I, a lot of people don't know, and that is that I actually took a whole year off. 2016, I took a sabbatical. And that really helped me revisit, am I going to continue to do this into my <laughs> old age? Um, but it also allowed me to explore um, being back in Latin America for a year and my kids went with me and we, they learned Spanish and it was truly a moment of taking a break from farming and being able to do that was such a gift for, for me. And, you know, I know it, it was a challenge. It was like a big old puzzle to figure out, to make it work. But, um, it, it was something that I knew if I didn't do that, I would be an angry human. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to be that. <laughs> no, I mean, congratulations. That's so wonderful to hear you were able to do that. Um, what advice would you give, you know, farmers who are thinking about wanting to take a sabbatical year? What did you learn through that experience of what you do the same or differently? And how would you set it up within your farm business? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, initially I actually thought that we were going to have, I was going to have, I tried lots of different scenarios out in my brain and, um, and actually talking to people. And I originally thought that, um, I would leave the farm in a smaller capacity, um, open. And in the end, none of my coworkers were really, really excited about taking on that challenge. And I realized that that alone was going to be such a stressor for me that this business 
maybe who said other people weren't absolutely excited about maintaining for me. So, you know, we took a big step and we actually shut everything down. And, you know, that meant that meant a lot of different things. It meant making sure our farm had cover crop all over it. It made sure that we took all the plastic off all the houses and, um, you know, made sure everything was tarped. And, um, you know, we also originally thought that Al, my husband, Al was going to come with us. And in the end, he was really, this was a very important point in our relationship where he was really able to say, I don't want to do that. And he didn't speak Spanish. And, I knew also that if for me to be able to have the experience be what I wanted it to be, I had to be okay with letting him not go with us. And, and in the end, it worked out great. He ended up taking on a building project that he wanted to do for years. And he got exactly what he needed at a moment in his life. And I got what I needed. Um, and the farm was okay. I know we we lost a few CSA members who found other farms that were like you know closer to them. By this point, there were a few other CSAs, and um, but more than more than that, we we came back, and I came back with an energy and an excitement and a realization that yes, I I do want to do this for much longer. Um, given that a person died, and then we were offered this opportunity. I feel like I never chose to be a farmer. It was like it landed on my doorstep. And every year there was this tension of like, wow, am I really going to do this again? <laughs> um, and it took like 10 years to get rid of that feeling. And then, uh, and then when, we, when I was able to go away, it, just, it, was, it was a fantastic opportunity for travel and experiences. So I highly recommend it. And I've definitely availed myself to people if they want to talk about more of the logistics of how we made that work. And yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I mean, I love sort of the idea of like your land and your farm was able to rest and rejuvenate, you know, along with the farmer. So um, sounds like a win-win both, both ways. And I think your CSA went on to grow, you know, even bigger than it was before you took the pause, right? Yeah. So that's what I did. Yeah. So there's absolutely. the silver lining. <laughs> whether whether mm -hmm, you intended mm -hmm. for it to grow that much or not. <laughs> right. Right. Um, no, that's great. Uh yeah. Well, what where do you where do you see things going, you know, five, ten years from now? I mean, you had that pause and now it's been a number of years since. I mean, do you have sort of a succession plan in place? Or what are you I know that's such a sticky subject. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I am. I am thinking about my physical capabilities. You know, ten years from now, I think I. Um, so to be specific about a plan, right now there is no written plan. There is no exact plan. Um, it is a conversation that Al and I talk about somewhat regularly. Um, I think for me, one of the things I am thinking about is who who is that person who might want to take this over. So this, you know, I think I have a, a number of good years still left in me, but um, I am looking for who could that manager position be and really exploring what a manager might be able to do to alleviate some of the, some of the tension and the pressure and explore letting go. I think that's going to be important thing, important, an important part for me. Um, I'm also really exploring all of the, everything on our property. We have a number of like little hillsides. We have some buffer areas where we can't grow vegetables. And I'm like, I want to, I want to plant all of them to something. So one of the things I've been working on this winter is this um, kind of an extensive landscaping plan with the eye towards productive, um, like, productive plants that can be used for cutting. And um, I'm, I'm going to put a ton of winterberry in and I'm actually thinking about what it would be like to cultivate willows. You know, there's a whole market for that. And again, I can plant all those in areas where I currently can't farm vegetables. So that's got me really excited. And I'm, uh, that's again, just kind of right in process. Um, we're just ordering plants and organizing that. 
Yeah, no, I love I love the idea of like investing in something that actually ages with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice, nice <laughs> quote. I like that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it. I I love all these conversations with farmers at so many different stages of their farming career because, you know, th th these questions of like the future and how you're going to farm and age gracefully or, you know, they should be on your mind if you're young because you don't want to save it for, you know, the end of your career. So um, one one complicated thing about our, you know, our property situation is that, you know, we want someone to be here. And if they're going to be here, then it kind of means we can't be here. So, you know, that, that means like, where are we going to live? And, you know, cause there's not multiple dwellings on this property where of, you know, a full farm family could be here. And, um, I mean, that's not true. We do have a small apartment, but, um, but yeah, I'm sort of thinking if someone's going to take this on that I want to come back and hoe for them, <laughs> but, I don't want to be looking over their shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that that's really like looking for the right the right person, and uh, it's I don't want to. Uh, it's it brings me op optimism to think about passing what we have on and leaving it in the most beautiful and productive way that it can be. Um, I do know that there are other folks who have struggled to find people to to do this. Um, I think about some, yes, yeah, some other older colleagues who have vegetable farms and it seems like it should be a no brainer that some young person of course wants to come in and farm your land <laughs> and take over your business, but it actually isn't. So I feel like it's a challenge that we'll be addressing for a while. Yeah. No, it, it, it is not any, you know, unfortunately it is not easy and I, I wish it was, um, but there's just so many different variables and interpersonal dynamics and, you know, so many things that you're navigating and trying to um, pay attention to. And it's not easy sometimes. So, yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck with your process. Um, and I hope it goes as smoothly as possible. Um, so on that note, let's turn to our lightning round questions, if you are ready for those. Okay, number one, what gets you up in the morning? I would say what gets me up in the morning is the sun. My husband calls me solar powered, and I am, I love the sun. So, and this time of year, my 6 a.m. CrossFit class gets me up. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> Uh, number two, what's the hardest part of farming? I think the hardest part for me is being in charge all the time. There's always something that you need to be thinking ahead about or doing or relaying, communi communi the communicating. So I do love this time of year when I feel like I can let go of that always being in charge feeling. What is the favorite way to relax or self-care activity or how do you take care of your body, heart and mind as a farmer? Yeah, so many, so many different things. One, I get a, I get a massage once a month, all year round. Good for you. That's, That's great. And really, really critical for me. I'm very lucky I get to do it as a barter. Um, as I said, I do love to listen to audiobooks. I find that little mental escape is just so fun. And I do, like I said, I love walking my dogs. And then what do you love besides farming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I was thinking that what I really love, I love speaking Spanish. So that, that's been a big part of my, my other life. And so I have been listening to novels in Spanish and podcasts in Spanish. And then I am a Spanish interpreter at a local medical clinic. And so during my off season, I go there or sometimes I do it via Zoom um, once or twice a week. And I really love exercising my brain in that way and also being of service to an immigrant community. Mm. When you visit um, Puerto Rico, are there farms that you are farmers that you're friends with down there that you visit? Yeah, you know, um, we have visited, um, we have some farmer farming friends actually here who have a farm. Um, but we're a little bit selfish in that way. We literally just go to the beach and plant ourselves. <laughs> so and there is okay, very good. little being grown on this small island of Culebra. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm sure you must be a hit when you can, you know, understand exactly all the different 
you know, vegetables and cuisine and everything. So that's yeah. probably fun. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. What would you be doing if you weren't farming? Um, if I weren't farming, I would probably be working in Latin America with a nonprofit organization, maybe teaching people about horticulture. <laughs> Still got to keep, keep the uh, yeah, a little, little bit, a little that, bit of yeah. farming in there. <laughs> Uh, what is one piece of advice you wish you had starting out or something you wish you had done differently? I think um, starting out, we we probably would have purchased a few more things that would have made our lives a little bit easier. I think we were really uh, keen on not going into debt. We had four things written on our refrigerator and one of them was stay out of debt. So. <laughs> We, uh, we, we took that literally. And I think in the future that if I had to do it over again, you know, we might have purchased a few things that would have been higher ticket items that would have made our lives easier. I'm curious, what are the other three things that were written on the refrigerator? <laughs> oh, uh, it's, actually there. it's actually still there. It says, um, eat responsibly, bring the land to bear and stay out of debt and laugh. Oh, I like that. And it stayed there all these years too? It's, yeah, you know what? I think it got put away for a while. And then we did a little kitchen redo recently and it came right back out. What do you long for and how does that influence how you farm? I think I, one thing I long for is less of the need to have information at your fingertips and to sort of relish in the searching part. I feel like with our phones and technology that there is no longer, you no longer need to wait to learn almost anything. Not that you learn the right lesson or the right way or proper, you get proper information, but um, you can get your question answered pretty quickly. And I, I think there's something really lost when, especially our younger generations don't necessarily see the benefit of the learning curve and how it is a journey. Mm. Oh. So whatever, I long for a moment where we can come back to the learning journey and the sort of respect that we have for the folks who do have experience and how we can learn from them. Mm. I like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost like the creativity that comes out of the boredom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you feel is your gift to give on behalf of people and the land? Uh, my, I think my gift is um, twofold. One, I, I love bringing people together. So I started a group locally called Farmers Gather. I co-started co it with some folks, but it was sort of an inspiration of mine. And that is to really create some camaraderie and connections amongst our local farming community. And that's been a lovely way to, to connect with people. Um, I also really love facilitating meetings. <laughs> and I love um, hearing be able pe people being able to speak in a safe way, even if it's like a steering committee meeting or a, something a little bit more personal. Um, being a part of a group, being heard and having something run efficiently I, brings me a lot of joy. I love that. Mm. Yeah. It also means you have to be a good listener too. So it sounds like you are. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. I think I'm a good listener, yeah. If you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? I think it, it goes back to that, what I said originally about eliminating the addiction that we have to knowing things immediately. And I would love that, that there were a little, you know, a little bit more pause in, in our world. Um, I also think I would love to have a little bit more integration with the urban and the, and the rural. I feel so lucky to be here in this lovely, gorgeous place and to see the fruits of my labor and my crew's labor and the generations before me. And, and when I go to New York City, which is not very often, it's mere two hours away, I just think, oh my gosh, this is very different. And what would it be like if people, rural and urban people, understood each other a little bit more? Mm. Yeah, I like that. 
And finally, how will you grow old or how are you growing old farming? I am going to grow old kicking and screaming (laughs) and moving and walking and (laughs) doing a lot of interesting things. I'm going to, I feel really strongly about just continuing to bring things, do bring things into my life that bring me joy, but also keep my head, keep my head in the game and learning and, um, Yeah. And it sounds like always having your hand in the soil in some capacity. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you and learning about your life and your farming journey. And you bring so much wisdom and, you know, intentionality to what you're doing. And I really appreciate this time with you. Yeah, likewise. Really great to meet you. Today's show was produced by me, Clara Coleman, with support from No-Till Growers. Special thank you to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Thank you to the patrons at patreon.com slash no-till growers for helping to make this show possible. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week.